I'm Michel Roux and I am passionate about bread. This is the kind of bread that I want you to be eating. It's proper artisan bread. It has heart and soul. Never ever buy another loaf of that white sponge. I strongly believe that for too long we've been sold bread that is lacking in nutrients and flavour. The time for change is now, before we lose the art of good baking forever. So in my campaign, I want to change the way you think about bread. From the wheat that makes your flour... You shouldn't be allowed to be call yourself a master baker until you've gone through every stage of the process. I agree with you, yeah. To the craft of baking an honest loaf. This is amazing. This turns me on something, I tell you. Great. This is you, and I can feel that. It's great. I'll also be in the Revival Kitchen, showing you some great ways to get involved, including a fantastic alternative to a white sliced loaf. Mm. So simple to make. As well as some other mouth-watering recipes, which bring out the best of true artisan bread. If anything is going to make you join our bread revival, it should be this. A massive nine million loaves of bread are sold in the UK every day. But only 3% of those are baked by a traditional craft baker. I consider myself a Frenchman and the smell of a boulangerie makes me feel alive. Sadly, the art of baking in this country is under threat. More often than not, bread in this country is seen as a fast food. There is another way. This beautiful white bread, it's real bread cooked by professionals. I want the tables of Britain to enjoy this bread. In Britain, 80% of all bread is made using the Chorley Wood bread making process, an industrialized method of baking bread that allows factories to churn out loaves on a vast scale, and nothing like the artisan bread that I want you to be eating. Chris, tell me, I've heard a bit about the Chorley Wood bread process, and as far as I can understand, it's actually cutting corners. It's making bread very, very quickly, and therefore reducing the price. So is, is that about right? Absolutely. It's, it's about how can we get the cheapest loaf possible with the, the basic ingredients. So you basically whip it full of air, pump it full of carbon dioxide, and then you, you bake it off. Uh, and in the process, you have to add a load of additives to make sure it goes through the machine. So instead of adapting a machine to work with the dough, you adapt the dough to work with the machine. It's wrong, isn't it? And then it's baked off and start to finish in something like an hour. That's crazy. Minutes. That's crazy, because for me, a real loaf, I mean, it, it takes hours and hours of, of love to make it, you know, have that taste and, and the flavour and that beautiful crust, I mean, that you don't get on a loaf like that, on an industrial loaf. Take these two things, OK, they look a bit different, but what's that? That's bread. Real bread, flour, water, yeast, salt. What's that? What do you think has gone into that? So, let's have a look. We've got flour, water, yeast, salt. Fine, that's, that's bread so far. OK. <laughs> Let's go on. Spirit vinegar, soya flour, emulsifier, mono and di diacetyl tartaric esters of mono and diglycerides of fatty acids. Uh, rapeseed oil, that makes it a bit softer. Sunflower oil, palm oil. So what's that, 14 things as opposed to four? Is this bread? No. For me, no. Most definitely not. Talking to Chris was fantastic because he is passionate, as passionate as I am, about bread. And I was quite surprised. I mean, I knew there was a lot of additives in these white loaves, industrial loaves, but I didn't realise to, to what extent. For my campaign for a revival of artisan bread to succeed, I'll need to convince the bread-making industry that there is an alternative to the Chorley Wood loaf. Hello, yes, it's Michelle here. I'm meeting Gordon Poulsen, the director of the Bakers' Federation, the voice of the industrial bakers of Britain. Morning, Gordon. Morning. Good to meet you. And you. My utopia, my, my, my dream is to have a artisan baker on every street corner, like we used to have, and like we have uh, in the rest of Europe, in France especially, where I come from. And I feel that these mass bakers, by very definition, they are hindering that process. I don't think we're hindering it at all. I think all we're doing is responding to the consumer demand and, and the consumer need. And why have the British got this infatuation with this, this spongy, white, cotton well, bread? Well, I, I mean, 
I don't think we should criticise the consumer. The British consumer is the British consumer, and it gets the product, value product, that it requires. Uh, for good or bad, bread in the UK is the cheapest in Europe. It's meeting the consumer needs and the consumer demands. At times I felt I was hitting a brick wall with Gordon, but I do agree on one thing with him, and that is that the only people that can change this are you, by demanding an artisan bread, or even cooking bread yourselves at home. So the first step on the road to revival is showing you how easy bread making can be. For my first recipe, I'm going to prove to you how simple it is to make just an ordinary white loaf. First put the milk onto a gentle heat. Then slowly melt some butter before adding a tablespoonful of golden syrup. The golden syrup is in there to give it just a touch of sweetness but also it helps to give that lovely moist crumb. So whilst this is melting, we put our fresh yeast in our bowl. Every bread needs some form of leavening, and this yeast is the leaven. It's the life. Pour the warm milk onto the yeast and stir until it's dissolved. We buy more white bread in Britain than any other variety. I want to prove to you that it is possible to make a really delicious white loaf. That's why I'm using white flour. Then add two pinches of salt to complete the dough. Then we're going to leave it for a while so that all the moisture is absorbed in the flour. And that's it. After just five minutes resting in a warm place, you can start to knead the dough. I'm just keeping it in the bowl, and I'm not really working it very hard. I'm just stretching, stretching the gluten in there. And if it does stick to your hands a bit, you can just get a little bit of flour and rub that on your fingers, and, it all, and your fingers come clean. There are no shortcuts to making a great loaf of bread. So after the dough has been kneaded for around 10 minutes, leave it to rise for half an hour to give the yeast time to do its work. And again, as soon as you take the cling film off, you can, you can smell those yeasts working. It has a lovely aroma, beautiful aroma. And it's smooth, it's glistening, quite beautiful. So I then turn this out onto the board. I remember these smells, these aromas, uh, as a child of waking up to freshly baked bread. I want every house in Britain to be baking, or at least supporting your local baker. Form the dough into two balls, place them in a baking tin and allow to rise for a second time. A bread that's only risen once and has been pushed through the whole process is bland and it hasn't had a life. A further 30 minutes in a warm place is all it should need. Wow, that looks beautiful. It's got that lovely shape, beautiful sheen, and it's ready to go in the oven. First off, we need to slash the bread. So we take a very sharp knife and just go over there like that. And that will help the bread develop and open up and into the oven. Now, the oven is at 200 degrees C, and we do that for about 10 minutes, and that helps to really push and, and make the bread develop, and then we turn it down to about 180, and it should take 30 minutes to cook. 30 minutes to wait for heaven. Here we go. It looks beautiful, and the smell is great. This is what I love about cooking bread. You never know exactly how a loaf will turn out. This is beautiful. And it's white bread, but it actually has got a crust, so it's crunchy on the outside. And it's got that lovely, delicate texture on the inside. It's got the perfect crumb. And you can smell all the ingredients in there. That golden syrup gives it just a hint of sweetness, but it, it's also helping the yeast to grow and to give that lovely texture. Good bread needs butter. Mm. Mm. 
so simple to make. But the pleasure you get out of that is indescribable. Mm. <laughs> Just as bread baking has become industrialized, so has the farming of its chief ingredient, wheat. Our heritage wheat that may be higher in nutrients and protein has been sacrificed for high yielding modern wheat. But I'm a perfectionist and I only use the finest ingredients in my kitchen. So my revival journey continues in South Lee in Oxfordshire, where I'm going to be getting back to the roots of wheat. Hi John. Hello Michelle. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. John, what are the fundamental differences between uh, the wheat that's grown, the bulk wheat that's grown in this country, and your heritage wheat? Well, I'd say modern wheat varieties are kind of drug-addicted, cosseted little plants that need fungicides and herbicides and pesticides, you know, in order to produce these, these you know, monstrous yields. But it doesn't necessarily produce good quality flour. Whereas my heritage wheats, they have very low input. You don't have to put any sprays. They outcompete weeds. They produce a really good quality flour. But the most striking thing that you'd first see is, of course, height. Modern wheat plants are, you know, down to there, a foot and a half, two foot tall, if that. And um, unless you have good weed control, they get swamped out by by tall weeds. Whereas my heritage wheats, they can grow six foot tall. And you know, they blow in the wind. They're very beautiful and colored. They look completely different from a modern wheat plant, uh, wheat field. I'm going to have to come back in the summer to see them. So I suppose growing it really is just the first step. And then we have to process it. And this is your old machine here. This is the old threshing machine, that's right. So before all these machines, it was literally done by hand. You would bash the Absolutely. top there to get the grains out. It was very hard labour. Very, very laborious. So you'd, you would bring it in from the field, fill up the barn, and then flail it out as and when you needed it. So the grain was always nice and fresh. Because kept like this, it will keep for a long time. It's in its own little capsule there and it's protected. Absolutely. And there are actually antifungal compounds in the husks around those grains. This is part of the reason why bread, for me, has such a, a great history and a value. Yeah, well, it's incredibly important because you can store it. It really is the staff of life. You can store vast quantities to feed people. Right, I want to go at this. Whoa. <laughs> Michelle, I think that you shouldn't be allowed to be call yourself a master baker until you've gone through every stage of the process. I agree with you. Yeah. The wheat is fed into the top of the thresher and produces straw for thatching and grain for John's artisan bread. I'm really, really loving this. This is what it's all about. Back to nature. I never imagined threshing wheat would be so exhausting, but I can't wait to taste the end product. And what will the Thatchers think of John's heritage wheat loaves? Right, guys, this is it. Moment of truth. All your hard work. And that's the result. Fantastic. Right. It looks great. Yeah, doesn't it? It looks nice. So this is with the wheat that you have grown. You guys have worked hard to put through that ancient machine. Fantastic. Let's hope it's worthwhile, eh? <laughs> it's great to see the final product after a year of growing in the field. and It tastes as if it's good for you. Mm. Mm. There's something kind of like nice and rural and rustic about it. You know, being a Thatcher, it's kind of sitting there with a loaf of bread and a, a lump of cheese. You're kind of like happy man, you know. I can relate to that. I mean, good bread, good cheese. You know, I'm happy. All I need now is a glass of wine. <laughs> as much as I love John's bread, it's not suitable for my next recipe. In fact, I need the bread that I made earlier. And the recipe I'm going to cook is a duck pie. But instead of using pastry, I'm going to be using bread, just to show how versatile bread can be. This recipe, I think, is, is ideal. It can be made hours in advance, and it can sit there in a warm oven, and you just have to bring it to the table, and I guarantee people will be ecstatic. It's one of these recipes that is a Roux household favourite. It's, in fact, one of my Christmas specials. Cut thick slices of bread and then trim off the crust. These rectangular slabs will form the case of the pie and need to be thick to help it maintain its shape. This is a really wholesome dish and a vital component is the sauce that will bind the flavours of the pie's filling. Start by sweating some shallots in duck fat, to which we add our port. Then add veal stock 
and let that reduce before turning your attention to the main ingredient. Now I make it with confit duck. Duck that's been cooked very, very slowly and for a long time in duck fat. Oh, I need to take the duck legs and the gizzards out of the fat. Then I need the, well, the basin to which I shred the duck into. Shred it into little bite-sized pieces. So we then chop up these gizzards, and chop these up. So the gizzard is so tender and flavoursome. You get a real, real kick of duck. There we go. Wild mushrooms are a great complement for duck. So I'm going to fry some in some duck fat with garlic and fresh parsley. So whilst they're cooking, I can start dipping the bread. So basically just in and out of the duck fat. Not drenched, because otherwise it'll be too oily. And we're lining the whole of this pudding basin with these little soldiers of bread. Okay, so there's a fair bit of duck fat in there and the bread. But as I said, I normally do this at Christmas time and it's Christmas. With the pudding case ready, mix together the duck, mushrooms and reduce sauce to create the sumptuous filling. All of these flavours will melt beautifully into the bread base. Pack that in really tight. And what's left is to cover the top with the little bits of bread that are left over so we dunk them again. There we go. Yeah. Cover the pie in foil and put in a medium oven for 45 minutes. Right, the pie must be cooked now. Wow, that smells lovely. Moment of truth. <laughs> that is beautiful. I mean, this is just heavenly. It just goes to show how versatile, how great bread is. I like to put a little bit of sauce on the top, just the sauce that we had earlier. Right, I can't wait any longer. Oh, gosh, look at that. Now, you need to get a bit of the bread and the duck. Oh. <laughs> the flavours are just so intense. The bread has soaked up all that fat and all the lovely duck and mushroom juices and become one. It's a little bit crispy on the outside, yet soft on the inside. It's fantastic. So here you have it, the duck bread pie made with my bread. In the 1950s, there were close to 30,000 local bakeries on our high streets. Today, there are fewer than 4,000. I'm on my way to Hackney to meet a guy who is as passionate as I am uh, about bread. He is bringing baking to the community. And if we are going to win this campaign, that is what we need to do. Ben McKinnon has only been making bread for sale for just over a year, but already his bakery under a railway arch in Hackney, East London, has become a thriving business. I'm hoping that he will inspire you to support your local baker. Right, Ben, I'm here for a reason, and that's to make bread. So let's do it. OK. First thing, in the fridge here, we've got the sourdough starter. The starter is the lifeblood of any good sourdough. It gives the bread texture and flavour. As a living leaven, if looked after properly, it can give life to bread across generations. Yeah, this uh, sourdough starter's got a bit of a story behind it, actually. Somebody came in to, to visit somebody in the kitchen. They said, oh, we use this culture which we were given from Lapland, and it's uh, over 200 years old, and she brought some in for me. That is unbelievable. From Lapland to Hackney. Yeah, yeah. And 200 years old. It's been constantly fed. I mean, to keep a sourdough starter going, you have to feed it sort of about once a week at least, just with uh, flour and water, and it kept in a cool place like the fridge. For me, this is what baking is all about. I mean, this is a million miles away from Chorley Wood. It, it's great. Well, enough talk. Now's the time to go and make some. So come, let, let's okay, go. let's do it. Do you think that making bread is an art form? I think it is. I think the whole, the whole process. I th think one thing that I've really found in making bread, and one of the reasons I think it's so good for other people to do it, is it kind of generates more creativity. 
You've certainly got time to be creative, as this dough will not be ready for the oven for another 10 hours. So is it possible to marry art and business and still make a profit? So how much do you sell your bread for? Uh, so this bread uh, I sell for £3.50 a loaf, which is about 800 grams when it's cooked. Obviously you're not doing this for a charity. But you have to see a return on that. Yeah, well, I've kind of jumped in. I'm just giving it as much of a go as I can, and so far, so good. I'm not, as far as I can see, I'm not losing money. Ben's sourdough might be three times more expensive than a mass-produced loaf, but considering the time and effort involved, I think it's worth every penny. Right. The dough is placed in floured bannertones to mould the loaves ready for the oven. Come on, darling. Just have to tease it out. Tease it out. Here she comes. This is where the skill of the master baker is evident. Each loaf is crafted with care and attention. You sell out of this stuff, don't you? So, oh, every day. Let me sell you, out. You, you obviously can't make enough of it, so there's a, there's a definite market for it. Yeah, well, people want to eat good food, and they want to eat food that uh, has been prepared without chemicals. I mean, there's only four ingredients in this. Well, three, really, is salt, flour and water, and the, the wild yeasts and bacteria there, don't they? Like works of art, each loaf is given its own signature before going into the oven where it bakes for just half an hour. Ben's 200-year-old starter has done its job and combined the ingredients to create something quite special. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll tell you, this is amazing. This, this turns me on something, I tell you. Really? It, oh, I'm it's really happy to hear the that. The smell and, and this signature, your lovely signature here, mm -hmm. it's personal, it's you. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not a machine, this is you, uh, and, and I can feel that, it's great. If Ben's story has touched you, why not take a course in bread making? Like this one in Nottinghamshire. It gives me a lot of satisfaction to come on the course because we learn everything about bread production from it growing in the field right through to it being baked and then sold on. So we're, we're learning the whole journey of bread and being artisan bread producer in this country. The students here have come from all walks of life. They've found the experience life-changing. Bread does need a revival in this country. Anyone can learn to make bread. It's not difficult so long as you have the fundamental building blocks to begin with. You can do anything. For my final recipe, I'm going to be using some of Ben's Hackney Wild Bread and my bread as well. It's a diplomat pudding. It's very, very close to my heart. It's a special recipe. It's the very first recipe that I learned as a pastry apprentice in 1976. This is a French version of a bread and butter pudding, but with a difference. And what's great is that you can actually use bread that isn't the freshest, bread that's stale, that would otherwise end up in the bin. So to start off, we need to remove the crust. There we go. You can use almost any combination of breads, as they'll all add flavour and texture. Slice them into cubes and scatter them on a baking tray. So here we are with our bread, and we need to dust it a little bit with icing sugar. So here we go. And this is just to give it a lovely coating, a crunchy coating that will caramelise in the oven. So we're making sweet croutons, in effect. While the croutons are crisping up, start to make the custard filling with egg, sugar and single cream. I'd rather use single cream than double. Double cream tends to be a little bit too heavy, a bit too rich. I remember as a young apprentice, 16 years old, being shown how to make this. And I remember the very first day that I walked past the pastry shop after work and I saw my puddings good enough to be sold in the pastry shop and that filled me with pride. The secret ingredient for this dish is vanilla. Vanilla is very expensive but it's very worthwhile. I think you get so much flavour out of it, so much satisfaction. And I love the idea of putting a very expensive ingredient like vanilla with such a humble and cheap ingredient as bread. Put a handful of raisins and sultanas in a pan. Cover them in water and put them onto a gentle heat to rehydrate. They'll plump up and become succulent. Then drain them and cover them in dark rum. 
These little packets of sweetness will be the bridging texture between the custard and the bread. Rum and raisin and vanilla. I mean, that's, is, is there a better combination? I don't think so. And there they are. Lightly toasted. And that smells gorgeous. And smell the yeast, the wild yeast in there. Uh, and, and almost brioche-like smell from my bread. It's beautiful. Then it's time to put the ingredients together. Into some buttered ramekins, layer the croutons and the raisins. It's as simple as that. It really is very simple. We ladle them into here. Now, you can make them individual like this in individual ramekins, or you could put it in a terrine and then take slices off it. But I think these little individual moulds look really cute. Unlike a classic British bread and butter pudding, don't put these straight in the oven. Instead, steam them in a bain-marie. Cover them with buttered foil and they're ready for the oven. On a medium heat, they'll take half an hour. Right, I think these puddings must be ready by now. You can't take them out of the mould whilst they're still piping hot. You need to leave them to rest just for five or ten minutes. Because if you were to take them out of the mould now, they would crack and they wouldn't look nice. While they cool, make an apricot glaze for the top of the puddings. Melt a large spoonful of jam in a dash of water until it turns into a sticky liquid. The jam's nearly melted. At last, it's time to reveal the diplomat puddings. Wow. All it needs now is a, just a little brush of the apricot jam on top. I find that these are at their best when they're just warm. Not cold, definitely not fridge cold. Diplomat pudding, made with the best artisan bread you can find. Oh, this looks beautiful. Mm. It's totally, totally delicious. You can taste the bread, you can taste the egg and the, the rum, the vanilla. It's beautiful. I've been on an incredible journey and I've met some passionate people, people who are as passionate about bread as I'm passionate about food. And that, to me, is heartwarming. That, to me, means that if we all join together on this crusade, we can definitely change bread in Britain.